Hello and welcome to the dive season four, episode thirty-two. We are mid playoffs. We're into playoffs. Uh, we got past the seventh and eighth seed. You know that that was really controversial, including them. Now we can for sure say that they're gone. <laughs> and we can for sure. both got in three O's. So, well, but we needed them. They saved Doublelift's career, as he said. You know, if, if without without those extra teams in the lower bracket, you know, just poof. Yeah, he's Darn. definitely thinking his lucky stars that it is a double elimination bracket because uh, if you want to get right into it, Mark, then let's get right into it. That TSM series, um, the the first 0-3 where they lost to Golden Guardians, Double has said it himself. A lot of people were already saying that was the worst series of his career yeah. and probably the worst showing that uh, that he has had, yeah. So do you guys think that's that's overreaction? Because to me, game three was like the worst game I can remember from him in NA, like as far as playoff wise. But I actually felt like he was playing pretty well in the first two two games, at least in laning phase and stuff. And as far as like, you know, being in losing matchups and he's playing, you know, long, alongside a rookie who's who's kind of in his first ever LCS playoff series. Like I felt like it was OK. Uh, the game three left a really bad taste in everyone's mouth. He played bad. And there was also the the TP play, which like really was like a stinker. It just game three in general was horrible. But like over, I, I felt like people took game three and and acted as though that was how he played for the whole series. I mean, not saying game, it's good, but game, game three, was, three was worse. But I still don't think it's an overreaction to say mm-hmm. you know it's the the worst series you know that that he has ever played. I he, will, uh... he made a lot of mistakes in in game number one and game number two, and that teleport one. That everyone pointed out was actually the, the, the memorable the second the second one too but they not in that series it was yeah. was it was it was, uh, it was earlier in the year uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, a week or two ago or whatever yeah. um the only other one i would submit i think i mean he he played in relegations because clg lost to uh yeah yeah it's hard to remember some of the seals but series i would say the day. one that i remember being really you know bad from him was against us uh team liquid C- spring 2015 and that's where the whole auto spacing meme came from because piglet <laughs> dumpstered him and he was like my god piglet's auto spacing is just too good and everyone's like what are you t-? <laughs> like everyone kind of knows what you're talking about but it was not it was not a term anyone ever used and so yeah. he got memes a lot for that yeah i actually want to jump on this because uh i i, I always thought it was so hilarious um there's multiple topics right so one of them Orb walking, the original term way back from Dota, from Dota before League of Legends even existed, when there were these items in Dota that were actual orbs. Um, and I forget which, cha- but there was like a champion that also uh, had like a, an orb walking ability, but um, getting your auto off, you don't need that full time and you can cancel some of the later parts of the animation and use the in-between time to gain distance and walk. That, that's the general thing that um, you know, allows you to be better. You chase down people or or kite people better. That's that is true in League of Legends. There's an auto attack wind up. You just have to get that off. Then you can cancel the rest of it, and you can use the the rest of your time for movement. That is one thing. There is also using range discrepancies in AD carry champions, most notably with Caitlyn because her range is so much longer. Get an auto off outside of your opponent's range, and don't allow them to close the overlapping range to get an auto off on you you know either with slows or um movement speed or anything like that and so you're you're playing on constantly playing on this auto attack range discrepancy and those are both interesting and really cool (laughs) actual strategies but the auto spacing meme that actually exploded just meant nothing and was so hilarious that everyone just got on board yeah it was, uh, it was, it was, I mean, anyone who's had as long as a career as Doublelift is going to have some stinker performances. So, I, you know, they're pretty yeah. few and far between. And he, this was the first loss in the best of five and 13 best of fives in a row, you know? And this, so, this one was really notable because they got yeah. stomped, right? Yeah. Like, well, again, I mean, they got 3 0 The results were stomped. The first two games were pretty close. First two games were, you know, you know, could have gone either way. You know, Golden Guardians did, did play, play better and like pull it out. Uh, the last I, game was definitely a stomp. Yeah. I, I uh, you don't think the, the first two games could have gone either way? The the backdoor one, which I think was game two, was pretty close. Golden Guardians, I think that was also the one where they lost their the, goal. The first pretty... game, TSM was actually in control, and then they lost that one. They lost two bad fights in a row, right? Like it felt like they had kind of like gotten yeah. into a, a decent spot. Like both one and two, I think, were winnable. Um, oh, either way, they got three would right? Yeah, they and... got three would They played like 
absolute doo-doo in game three. Uh, it was definitely for sure one of, if not the worst performance of double his career. I think that's completely fair to say, especially considering, you know, the, the high standards of this player and, and how dominant he has looked. Yeah. It's not what people expected. You know, he's against a, a, a new guy in an FBI um, yeah. and people expect him to trash him. And I mean, as much as you're saying, like the first two games weren't that bad, you're still first picking Caitlin and you're getting counter pick on support. Yeah, but they but is wanted that, that, they wanted to be lane Dumbler, dominant, though, or is that on treats? Because to me, I felt like there was a lot of like misplaced, uh, kind of like hate or like criticism towards Doublelift when I, I I felt like treats was hard trolling in game one and two, and also didn't have the ability to to answer any of the support picks. I mean, yes, that's on both of them, but also, I, I mean, I think people just don't realize that like FBI is just straight up the best laner in the league. He's in, really good, marks, yeah, in the marksman position. So like, I think. It was a bit of a wake-up call to fans who had kind of had their eyes shut to FBI, how good he was. I also don't think Double have played well, like great in laning phase. I don't think he was playing insane. Uh, and then the, the the support counterpick thing was obviously the biggest issue yeah. with it. But, yeah. I mean, they're losing 2v2 in all three games, right? It's a super big thing, big thing to me because the the supports de- determine a lot of the early stages of the lane. And if you don't pick, um, you know, Karma or Lux or something that can have uh, this pressure into a Morgana lane, then it it greatly it greatly raises up the AD carry that's that's playing with that Morgana, right? And they they had yeah. uh, they had it for the first two games. They utilized it super well, FBI and Huhi, that is. And I think not enough credit really being given to how well the Golden Guardians play in this and everybody's just so focused on tsm the higher seed how bad they're playing and how many mistakes they made which they did um but but honestly i think the golden guardians also really stepped up yeah they're, they're bottom lane smurfing like i'm not trying to take credit away from them at all i think that they are incredible i agree with mark they're the best laning duo in the league again i think more cre- like fbi is great don't get me wrong but again I, I think it's both situations where people get so focused on on the marksman player that they forget about the support more yeah. i know who he has been getting credit but people are like fbi best laner in the league you know like and and i hear that so much and i don't i don't hear people talking about who he's laning prowess as much people are giving credit to who he don't get me wrong like that is popping up more but like i just think in general when you're talking about the laning prowess of a marksman like it has to be the lane it duo because i think the support has actually more of an impact on the laning phase than the marksman does and who he has been smurfing it in in a lot of these easy lanes even back in the regular season you know he's playing aggressively he's willing to counter pick and, and and pick aggressively and like their their strategy even coming into the series was was partially to go for these blind picks with the assumption that treats wouldn't be confident enough to have an answer and they were right and it paid off big time yeah, I just want to like, so there's a scenario, right? And because they played Morgana two times, this is c- scenario literally occurred multiple, multiple issues where you see, oh, the announcer uh, in the game is like, boom, headshot, you know, FBI kills, uh, you know, treats or something like that. But how the announcing actually goes is like, oh my God, who he hits the binding. Then you put the trap on it. Then you get the headshot. Then you chase them down. Then you get this kill. Uh, ooh, who he Morgana W. They're pushing the wave. Oh, they get the early level two. <laughs> they kill the minion. Uh, Boom! He threads the needle. They li- like the a lot of this, you know, support work. Um, <laughs> we could kind of change change the uh, uh, like the the in game thing for like big assist. <laughs> Yeah. I think <laughs> assist, uh, legendary assist, assist streak. <laughs> yeah, legendary Pens assist, assist streak. <laughs> I also think, like, as much as we hype FBI in lane, he's he's so good outside of it too. Game one had that flash forward, and like multiple people in in uh, Golden Guardians played that team fight well. Closer was having a rough game, but he had a good alt to to, to pull them away. Uh, you know, double of tunnel vision. I think, which is another reason people are are slamming him because. He didn't have a QSS to deal with the Mord, which I actually yep. think is okay if you think you're going to play well and like you know can kite him out. But then he like runs forward into the teleport, self self stuns himself to get the alt on Demonte and like there's yeah, a bunch of these problems. Bad. And during that time, FBI is popping off and flashing in. And yes, you know big binding by who he. We already talked about closer splitting up the fight. Hanser gets the solo kill. Everyone played well, but I just don't think there's many 80 carries in the league who after like getting you know flashed on are going to then flash in the other way. Most people just panic yeah. like reaction flash out or something so yeah i think fbi gets a lot more of the credit um partially due to you know 
the insane stats and stuff like you're talking about, but he also does, you know, play quite well. And I have no problem overstating his contribution in a landing phase as he is such a young new player. Mm -hmm. I mean, James showed me, you know, on the desk, he was like, dude, you know, we weren't on camera. He's like, he only has 1900 Twitter followers. And we're all like, this is one of the best players in our league. Doesn't even have 2000 Twitter followers. Like what the hell? And so we had, we started that kind of Twitter campaign to try and get him more followers. Cause it's like, this guy cannot be overstated right now because he's he's pretty far into the radar. So I don't mind maybe giving him a little bit of who he's credit right now. Um, yeah, and no, I understand this. I, I'm happening. really excited for him. Like between yeah. him, Johnson, and Tactical, I am hyped for for some new guys to the league, young mm-hmm. guys in the league that are exciting marksman players. I want you know that conversation to be there. I want them to be you know battling and overtaking you know Doublelift and Zven and guys like having that competition at the top where you have this new wave of players that you're really excited about. I think that is awesome. I just uh, think that somewhat due to the nature of, of Doublelift, you know, he is always going to get more positive when he does well and more negative when he does poorly, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I did think that Treats was was pretty much non-existent in that series. You know, I remember when he was playing his bar game, I remember one alt he had landing and it was actually like arguable if it even helped. It was that tier two, uh, tier two mid lane turret dive where they like already were killing the person and then he ulted them while they were killing him and then they killed him after still. Uh, his thresh game, you know, didn't really do anything. But either way, you know, they, they improved in the next series. We can kind of get into that a little bit. You know, double of saying, hey, the lower bracket may have potentially saved his career. I think that's a little bit like melodramatic. It's not as though no one would ever have picked up double lift again. Um, hey, man, he knows how to get a headline. I like it. I like it. And, and I mean, he was still in he was still in the running for all pro, right? Like he, he ended up being fourth in voting, but he was in, in there. So it's not as though that would be completely gone. But like I could see it, it, it like you know, really damaging your reputation. And he obviously wants to make it to Worlds and there's high expectations. So I can see it through that point of view. Um, but clearly he wasn't that happy with the with how they were playing. And the whole team wasn't happy with how they were playing against Dignitas. Like he was talking about that as like beating Dignitas is the bare minimum, right? Like, you know, that they weren't really excited about how they even won, even though it was a 3-0. And I thought one of the things that was interesting was how much he was talking about you know, he mentioned treats, but really just, you know, them in general, um, TSM in general, how he felt like they were just playing nervous, right? They were playing scared. They're not willing to take trades that they were normally taking. So as a result, they're kind of just sitting back in lanes and getting pushed in. And I think that did somewhat show itself like in, in the previous series too against Golden Guardians, where it's like, you know, if you're not willing to, to play these trades aggressively and actually like go at your opponents and you just sit back on the bard and the thresh and whatever, then there's no way to win against the Morgana, right? Um, and I think that was an interesting discussion. So that's something that that is tough to change though, right? Like it's like, how do you build confidence in a week, right? Like you, you have to hope that you're practicing your training. You just kind of like ingrain that, that you need to play, take that aggressive stance, but it's tough. Yeah. I mean, you, you end up in kind of a downward spiral and, and this is true for, you know, anybody can relate to this. If you play league of legends in like a competitive mindset, even, even in ranked, when you start to lose rank game after rank game, after rank game, Mm -hmm. you start to question even your own play. And are you even good anymore? Speaking from experience, I'm like, (laughs) have I lost it? You know, I can't get back to, you know, my, my previous rank, you know, what, what am I doing wrong? And so many things start to come in, Mm -hmm. um, into it, that it, it does make you change your play style. And that it can be a slippery slope for, for professional players. Confidence is huge. We talk about it every single year when we go to worlds, for every single dominant team from from every region and and people going up against them always are talking about okay you know you you have to turn nameplates off or you have to play with confidence because if you start to give up free moves to your opponents assuming oh they are so good they must be invading me for a reason and then you look at the vod review and you're like oh no actually it was just their support all by himself (laughs) getting free vision in our red quadrant uh, we could have easily killed him, but now they end up with two deep wards and they mm-hmm. see every single next move that we have for the next three minutes and they actually end up snowballing. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you visualize, if you think your opponent is already that much better than you and playing that much better than you, you don't contest them on these little areas where you could gain an advantage. And it's really kind of disheartening, disheartening to hear some of the, our our players that have been our best players in the league for so long having fallen fallen to that level and and starting to question themselves like this because double also says he and knows and all of them know 
that Bjergsen is carrying them. I was about to go, yeah. His, the ending of that interview is just, he's just like, yeah, we all know Bjergsen, Bjergsen's carrying, and it would feel so bad for us if we not get knocked out of playoffs with him playing like this. So there are, there's so much just as far as the mental game that, that they have to correct here, making a bottom of the bracket run. This is double elimination, but you're now in the bottom where, um, you know, they have to win every single series here, uh, you know, yeah. to, to make it to the end. Do or die. And looking forward, like I think, Bjergsen uh, is actually playing insane. Also, Hanser talked about it in his interview where he's like, our strategy was stop Bjergsen because if Bjergsen can't carry, yep. they're going to lose the series. And that was their, their mindset. And I think that is something that TSM has to figure out. Uh, in their victory over Dignitas, they played three different carry comps. They had a mid carry comp, a jungle carry comp, and then a top lane carry comp. And yeah, you can beat Dignitas with all three of those styles, but I'm worried about when TL or Golden Guardians drops down because they get the loser of that series. Are you going to be able to execute three different styles against these teams who more or less have one play style that they're they're honing in on? Because yeah. Broken Blade is inconsistent. You have these concerns that we've already kind of hit on the bot lane. Um, Spika as well as young and, and does seem to have some hit or miss games as much as his, he can pop off. And so I'm a little concerned that they don't have a super defined play style as much as like Bjergsen's hard carrying. It's like, yeah, but then he plays set games and like you can carry on set in the sense where you're making insane setup plays, but you're still setting someone else up. And if that guy doesn't show up that game, you just get popped. Yeah. You're, so, you're, a, you're a force multiplier, right? It's like, you know, yeah. if, if you make a perfect engage and, and you're, you're like, your Caitlyn is popping off that it's like, you're really enabling them. Right. And they already have a lead and then they snowball and they win the game. But like, if your carries are all having a crappy game, everyone has played those tank style champions where it's like, you're playing Malphite, you get a five man at <laughs> all. And then you immediately lose the fight because all your carries are, are worthless that game. Uh, yeah. and that's kind of how, you know, that set game felt a little bit uh, for Bjergsen, you know, also credit to Hanser. I think, you know, in, in, a lot of his Mordekaiser games, you know, he was he was actually shutting down Bjergsen with alts. He was shutting down junglers with alts. You know, so yeah. that was part of it too. Um, but you know, my my feeling is really that TSM has to be able to step up in the bottom lane. I think that you can't get run over in the bottom lane like that because I think that you know that your marksman doing well is the key to allowing more mid lane flexibility, right? The set pick works if your bot lane's doing well, and I think that requires double lift to play better, uh, and I think that also requires streets have more flexibility and to play better, right? Um, you know, they can't just lose to blind pick Morgana and stuff every game. That's just not going to work. They, they won't get further. The sad thing was it happened in the Dignitas series again. They they kind of dealt with... Struggling. Well, they blind picked Morgana and then they then they lost to the Karma. Kind right, of, which but is... They, they did okay in that lane, but yeah, I hear you. I mean, they yeah, they were pretty pushed in the, the yep. rest of the map was doing well so it didn't matter yep. i think it well, happened and that's that's a perfect illustration though of what they should have been doing to golden guardians right there there's very clearly like, like ash karma beats caitlin morgana in lane that is a winning 2v2 because yeah. all of a sudden you have you have like two people pushing the wave and you have heavy poke the like black shield no longer matters what are you gonna stop the tether who cares you know yeah. so um, you know, I think that was a good illustration of, of why we were talking about, you know, the lack of flexibility from, from treats and from their bottom lane in the previous thing, uh, you know, the bright side for TSM fans, it's very clear, uh, that there's an issue there. So hopefully they can fix that when it's um, one pick you can, and you have a week to figure out what your answer is to it. You should be able to. Yep. Uh, but I mean, it was really cool to also see. Oh, go ahead. Koi. Yeah. I mean, a, a lot of the things, um, uh, people were talking about coming in late as, uh, for TSM answers like, oh, then they did play the karma they they did pick it up oh then double if did buy a qss but you know later a uh, game afterwards yeah. you know oh you know next time you don't want to net into a mordekaiser uh and get <laughs> no, try that it, one right? again I'm not um, <laughs> honestly yeah you don't want to do that anytime but it's it's a lot of these little little learnings and and little mistakes that have to be picked up very quickly yeah um and and they don't have any more time left i think i think that's the big thing Yep, against any of the absolute best teams, one of those mistakes can sometimes end a game, right? Because one big team fight can be bare and whatever. Um, but also, you know, we, we saw some really cool picks coming out in in uh, the first week. That was something exciting for me. I will say, as much as the 7th and 8th place teams got clapped, and, you know, that was a little bit underwhelming, I have actually really enjoyed the idea that there is no world's gauntlet, that there's no, like, fallback plan for the teams. It has made every series feel more impactful for me like I, mm -hmm. I was, I was still actually really excited for those lower bracket uh, matchups as much as people are memeing seventh eighth, because it's like, well, if you lose, that's it. You're, you're not only out of the LCS, you're out of worlds. There's no backup plan. You must perform now, so it does add a little bit more gravity. I feel like to some of the the series. 
Um, and it was really cool to see, you know, Swain come out. Um, we saw a bunch of Hecarim games. We saw the Ziggs pick. We're seeing some innovation there, uh, I think, which is really exciting. And now that there's more 1016 games, like LPL is on 1016 for their playoffs. You know, you're seeing a lot of Lucian. You're seeing some some different uh, variations coming out in other leagues. So I'm I'm really excited to see the the continuation of the meta uh, developing because it does feel like there's opportunities for a lot of different stuff to to continue to like evolve and come out, which could get some teams some playoff wins. Yeah, I'm kind of like we. Go ahead, Mark. I was going to get us into the EG uh, games. Go I don't ahead. know if that's where you were going. Uh, you, no, I was just going to say, because we kind of talked about it last time uh, about, you know, the patch being so quick on playoffs and teams having to adapt. But I like that it it is like more intense prep for Worlds. I like that mm-hmm. we're putting pressure on teams to in super important series to have a new patch and try and get things quickly. And I have a lot of respect for the teams that did it that quickly and did have success. Everyone's like, oh, what is Ziggs? Ziggs broken, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, well, we haven't seen Ziggs in, in so long. And DeMonte has the confidence after, uh, you know, uh, like three or four days between yeah. games that they had to, oh, now we're on 10 16. I'm picking up Ziggs. We're going to use him to destroy towers. That's what the champion is supposed to do is destroy towers. And boom, 3-0, right? And Power of Evil, he's like, oh, I've been saving the Swain pick for a long time into Galio. Counter this composition with with specific strengths here of these unique champions. That Those are the types of things that we need for our teams to to have success at Worlds. Those types of counter picks and innovation and uh, kind of alacrity with picking up and, and changing and being adaptable. One of the teams breaking out new stuff was EG with the Hecarim mm-hmm. top. Uh, Freak thinks it's absolutely busted. I don't know. So if it is showed absolutely that. busted. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think not, Freak, not in that series. Real I think serious. Freak has been tunneling very, very hard on solo queue win rates for literally all things, matchups and just individual champions and stuff. And it, yes, they are. It is a good source of data, and it is hard data that we can use over you know big sample sizes. But with the same token, throughout the history of pro play, we have very often had 40% win rate solo queue champions be must pick in professional play because the way that you play at that level, the trading, the matchup is is different in some cases. I do like it as a baseline. And that is one of the first areas where I go to look for ideas for counters. Um, and, And I've even brought them up in the past. Um, and there was like one Jax one where Zale was like, oh, that well, that's a, even only 49%. It's not actually a, a winning matchup. But, you know, looking for discrepancies in these statistics and, and trying to then dig deeper than the win rate to find out why is, is this finding success and in what area. Because win rate only is one thing. Yeah. Might be a big winning lane, but then have a terrible win rate against it. And you just need to figure out how to turn this winning lane aspect which in solo queue is not going to give you a win in the game but in professional play and you're coordinated you can actually use the strong point of this champion kit or this interaction in a different way to get you a victory i I think i think those are the the next level things and yes i'm also spamming hecarim in solo queue and we're talking about the hecarim pick um i think it is a very strong overall champion and it's a good area to to find these indicators then incorporating that and the specific strengths into a specific strategy is is the key rather than like oh blind picking it in all these different scenarios or you know specifically no, knowing how you're going to utilize it yeah yeah i mean i think at the end of the day like uh, I, I like what you said about it like informing your decisions right like it's you don't yeah. you don't just like autopilot highest win rate pick highest win rate at every role and now you have the best comp right that's that's not how league of legends works especially not in pro strap um, a shen on that heck room <laughs> you know strap some strap some globals in here yeah, get them yeah. uh you know give them a yumi 2 <laughs> give them, give them the rock <laughs> oh boots. hell yeah um <laughs> But but I do think that like at times, and this is this is I think Freak is you know is, is focused on it uh, because oftentimes there's things that are incredibly strong in solo queue and it just feels like it's being completely disregarded by pros, yeah. right? And and especially in the past, people are like, well, that's not a pro pick, right? And we've learned kind of over time. Well, guess what? If something's really strong in, in solo queue, probably is a pro pick. Maybe it's a situational pro pick, but like things can transition. Um, and I, and and that's why you know I I know he's talking a lot about it. I think Hecarim is really strong, and and I think. One of the things that's really interesting for me about Hecarim Top is this is my take. Uh, I don't know if you guys agree or not, but like 
people say like oh like he- hecarim hecarim top has a high win rate but like oh that's like fraudulent because it's not that good in, in any lanes the reason people are playing hecarim top and, and doing well in solo queue is not because it trashes lanes hecarim doesn't slam a lot of matchups it's because he is hard to punish in, in a lot of lanes now like it, it, he doesn't just get destroyed and he's so good at team fighting like that is why i think he has a good win rate even from top it's not about oh my god, Hecarim into this is such a counter matchup. Even even the kind of like famous Hecarim versus Aatrox matchup, you know, I talked to Lakers a lot about that in the past, and he was like, no, it's not even that good in an Aatrox in the one v one. It's just that Aatrox can't kill me, and then I'm going to be popping off in team fights, right? And I think that is sometimes something that people lose track of is that like sometimes the counter pick doesn't have to be a lane counter pick. It can be something that is just worth more in in team fights. Yeah, and I think I think that's a it's a really important part to emphasize when yeah. when we're when we're bringing these things up. Also, think that Hecarim is super well situated to dive stuff that's very popular in the meta right now, like Ash, right? Yep. Um. So so but it also has tank some... Hecarim because that ain't that ain't killing anything. <laughs> Which brings us to Huni, and if you should be playing Hecarim given the team's play styles, that's should a, you that's be a... playing Hecarim if you don't have a Trinity Force? If you have adaptive helmet and a and a hex drinker, no, that's my answer. In in no situation is that the play, and that's where I think that like the blind picking discussion becomes interesting, right? Where it's like I think I think blind picking Hecarim is okay if you're willing to flex at jungle, right? Like if you're gonna do the set type situation and then they counter pick you top and then you just swap it, then I think that is more okay. Um, but like I think in a situation where you're gonna be building full tank Hecarim, it's just better to just have. Scion or Poppy or Orn I don't think I don't Maokai think anyone thinks or... you should be building f- full tank hacker. I think he just did it because the rest of the team he was, was getting trashed. Yeah, yeah. I think so. What I actually want to talk about is EG and Huni and Carries and what they should be doing because they. I don't. I don't want to talk about Hecarim, <laughs> Actually, I, it was I'm supposed kidding. to be a transition, yeah, but then it turned into the whole topic. <laughs> um, Can't get, just give us topics here, Mark. You give me an idea. I'm gonna say one we're... word. And I'm gonna see how long you guys go. <laughs> Cognid. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I think the, the FlyQuest EG series was a lot closer than I thought it would be. Um, yeah. But it, it weirdly didn't actually make me feel super good about either team because uh, I thought I was, I was going to be a lot hotter on FlyQuest. And then you have this kind of long series where they're, they're losing to EG, but who also looks like they're kind of struggling with identity at the same time. Uh, because they're they're doing the, these Hecarim picks and trying to play through Huni and it's not working. And then they swap to the the more play through Golden Glue play style. He had a great Oriana game. He has a great uh, LeBlanc game where Shen's supporting. And then the lower bracket after they lost that series, they kind of kept on with with the more Golden Glue focused uh, play style. And I think he played Shen the first two games in that that matchup. Mm-hmm. Um, the Shen LeBlanc and then Shen something else. I can't remember. Yeah, Shen LeBlanc and then. Oh, that was the weird one. Shen TF, uh, they didn't really have a carry for that, like, or an early game plan, because then they also ran it with uh, Ash TK, so you just had kind of, like, a bunch of globals, but nothing to play around. Um, they like side lanes. Yeah, but they didn't side lane forever because they, they <laughs> fell behind, and they were all down 30 CS, and Sven hard carried that game. Uh, so I felt great about Sven. Sven look, looked amazing uh, until he was put... kill graves? Yeah, until he was, was put on the Sichuani. That might be. That's an insane. It's it's, it's got to be up there. I remember. I remember contracts had. Uh, I think it was like the. I think contracts had the record at Worlds for most kills in a game on that Talia game, and I remember that was Worlds, so it's much less sample size than a regular season type thing. That was like fourteen, but like Pina it's got to be up there. Seventeen so, on Lee. Once. So if you're talking World Ride, I know there was no, at no, least one LCS. I know even there was at least a nineteen. Okay, is that the Peanut LCS. one you're talking about? Where he was against? I think it was like the VCS. So people always cite the Peanut one because he got like. 12 and- kills in such a short amount of time <laughs> yeah. and then i don't think he 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 wasn't the peak they were like there was a different game that was 19 oh, okay um, yeah, but i was peanut, just thinking of lcs players yeah. yeah the peanut one he got the kills so quickly everyone was like <laughs> oh my god this is a monster stomp yeah. and yeah, it was. we should go back and watch those highlights yeah pretty that, that's very hype but um i mean i will say uh, as a as a positive spin for eg I don't know if you guys remember. I was saying I thought EG was probably the worst team in playoffs coming coming into that week. So I for remember. me, for me, that was like, hey, you're competitive against FlyQuest. Hey, you won a series in the lower bracket. You go EG. Like that yeah. was more than I was expecting from them. They weren't perfect. I still don't think that they're going to win the split. But 
that was a, a higher level than I thought they were going to bring because I didn't think that they were going to be capable of, of being competitive against FlyQuest. I thought they were going to get run over because of some of these identity issues that you know you were kind of talking about, um, that they're, they're struggling to, to figure out what is their way to play, who is their carry, what are they going to do. Um, and I, I mean, at, at the very least, it's like they did get a, a couple of Shen wins. They had that Orn game that Huni was in lane, got solo killed, but they still won. You know, so it, it does feel like maybe that is the direction that they are going in. If they have figured out something with identity and kind of like stick to one direction, maybe that will, you know, spell good things for them going forward. Um, but I will say, I think that EG has has stepped up in in a way, right? Because um, they, they are playing, I think, a lot better than, than I was expecting, given their last few weeks of performance in the regular season where they really, you know, look like a mess. Like they're like, what, three and seven in last mm-hmm. 10, something like that. Yeah, they were tied for second to work. Like it was CLG and then I think it was like C9 EG or yeah. they might even been worse than EG. Or yeah. C9, C9. They were worse than C9 because C9 got some wins at the end. Yeah. From this series, the biggest changes to me because I already was like, all right, I'm very confident in Bang. And I was confident, despite not seeing him play a lot of the more lane-dominant, aggressive carries, and obviously he's played tons of Aphelios and Ezreal, you know, him him on Kalista, I was like, all right, so they have the option of trying to play through bottom Kalista, and then the Lucian one, it's like, all right, Bang is for sure ready to play, you know, beat him up bottom side from early uh, and try and focus that area. The biggest things to me were Sven Skarin stepped up in a huge way. He was really strong. And uh, Golden Glue, right? The, the Swole Bros were, were some of the biggest differences in that series versus 100 Thieves. Mm-hmm. And, of course, people are always going to bring up, but Golden Glue's opponent was Ryoma. So as we progress further, you're obviously going to have you know, more difficult mid laners that you're, that you're playing Jensen against. now, right? And, yeah, and, and if you're just going to slam down Jensen right in front of it, that's just like... I, that's going to yeah. be... Uh, I mean, they, they play the loser of actually C9 Fly, right? Because Golden Guardians is going to TSM. Oh, excuse me. I was thinking of, yeah, I was thinking of Golden Guardians. Yeah, I mean, either, me. either way, he played against POE and, and held up pretty well. Like, I don't think yep. Golden Glue was yeah, a problem. Yeah, but so. he didn't hold up well against 100 Thieves. He salamied right yeah, over. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. If you can go against right? POE and be okay, like, you're going to do yeah. well against some of the, the weaker players. POE is, is, is pretty, he's not lane dominant necessarily, but he is, is a, a, a pretty great player. So, uh, yeah, totally fine with Golden Glue. I want to see. I know you said that he has these Bang, has a Callista and and um, Lucian. I do want to see him pick up the Caitlyn. They haven't played it. He's only played a little bit of Ash, um, yeah. but I want to do see them index a little bit more towards the early game. Zazel mostly is on tanks and utility. He's not really known for his enchanters, but like if you're going to get into one of these like weird Kate Ash Morgana esque situations, I hope they go for the counter picks to enable Bang in the early game because I think he's their best player right now. And putting him on things that that aren't super relevant, uh, or like can't start influencing the game right away, I think is is a little too passive for your best player. Uh, the same way people don't want Bjergsen on set and stuff. That's how I'm thinking about Bang. The Senna pick is good. I'm glad he does it, but I don't want that to become his his default, which it feels like is happening a little bit. Yeah, I, I think I think you know the the last series was was uh you know good because there was no Senna, right? Like it was Lucian, Ash, Zaya. Um, and you know, he had been basically, you know, an Aphelios Ezreal guy throughout the whole season. Then he added the Senna and then that kind of became problematic because it got taken away some, uh, you know, against FlyQuest. So I'm, I'm happy that he has expanded that pool a little bit. Uh, I think that Senna is good, but I just think that teams drafting Senna and this is happening with Jin elsewhere in the world too, are losing track of what they need to make up for the deficiencies of those champions in team fight time, right? Because there's often so many tanks in the game right now and people are, are drafting Senna and Jin worldwide sometimes without any way to kill these tanks and it's like great you have a solid landing phase here with this champion and then there's an orn who who no one can kill right so you, you need to be able to kind of cover that deficiency with like you know maybe it's like a corky or a cassio or something or or have a graves alongside it like there has to be a well-rounded composition you can't just kind of slap this in in place of of the ophelios or in place of the caitlin it just doesn't function in the same way um, and that's something that I think teams need to to be able to adjust to. Or, and hear me out here, you have to be a confident team, but you don't draft another way to kill a strong tank later. You draft a laner into that tank that is going to just dumpster on this tank and make sure it is a weak tank. Th- those types of comps... But dumpsters aren't, though. Like always, always make me, like, my heart beat. Um, but is it not beating I mean, normally? Like, 
<laughs> Toby's a vampire. Uh, oh, you, guys, God. You, just, you guys are both just tearing me down uh, as soon as I try and start my Toby's speech. Heart and so my, when he has a lane counter. My speech here. His is, knees uh, get weak when he sees the counter pick into Orn. <laughs> I am trying to say that I want to see more LPL style where uh, <laughs> we've got a Conqueror Renekton top dunking on this Orn. The Orn gets killed at level two. The Orn gets killed at level four. It's getting dove under the tower. The tower is gone. All the turret plates are there. The Renekton's got two items at 10 minutes into the game and you just win this game. We get in, you Let's know, 25 go. minutes. It's over. It. You stop these fools. I want to see you know, team LPL style, the shy, taking risks, three playing games in super a row aggressive, getting knocked out of playoffs. <laughs> 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 Lucian Ken and Kale. Because <laughs> honestly, we're play. setting up towards worlds, and I've had enough of teams uh playing safe styles and 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 outscaling and and again, you know, I just I don't know if I can get my hopes up around around that stuff anymore. 2018 changed me. Yeah. Ever since we had that breakthrough and and Cloud9 were like, forget this, we're going hard in the paint. And we yeah. had this full upsets and the collapse of the Korean slower style meta and all that stuff. I'm like, don't go slinking back to that now. <laughs> we had nope. the revolution. That's true. I, I agree. I, I, I hope teams will be proactive. I hope teams will be aggressive. I do think that you're going to have to play like that, you know, uh, going towards Worlds. But Worlds is pretty far off. And we do have FlyQuest versus C9 coming up. That's going to be our first playoff match. You know, we what? talked about the teams in lower bracket. This one is going to be, uh, I think, really exciting. Can I just call a break here real quick? Because we jumped so quickly into reviewing last week and teams and stuff. We okay. skipped our whole intro section. Yeah, I, I didn't. I made and, a joke and then okay. you, you ran with us. Like, okay, here we go. We're well, we, we, can go we can go back. Yeah, <laughs> I was just thinking we're 35 we, minutes in here. Yeah, I mean, generally we we start out with, uh, you know, the the top hot topics, like news general week, stories, whatever. this yeah. stuff okay, and let's stuff. Let's it up. We got right into analysis, um, drawn in by the excitement TSM. of we gotta, last we gotta week's game. Clickbait TSM. Yeah. <laughs> well, done, well done, Mark. Uh, North America, though, um, we are about to lock in our world seeds. And since we just kind of lightly touched on that topic, um, are, are you kind of excited? I, I love that we are getting top three teams from summer playoffs. So clearly, those are the best performing summer teams. Top three. Boom. No excuses about it. Um, I mean, like I said earlier, I actually really like that that world seeds are on, on the line here, too. There's no fallback plan. You must do well in playoffs. Uh, I actually prefer this to the gauntlet. Um, I, I think it's made the matches really exciting. So I, I do think it's cool. You know, whoever wins these upper bracket matchups is going to be in worlds. They're going to be top three. So I think that is really exciting. Um, you know, we also had. Do you have any more thoughts on that, Mark? It seems. No, no, not really. I, yeah. I mean. I, I think it's cool. I'm excited to see who our first team for Worlds is, but we'll get yep. into that when we get into the actual matches. We also had the coaching staff uh, of the split revealed. So Team Liquid's coaching staff did win out there. You know that's pretty hype for them. Pretty hype for our boy Jet, who who you know in his first split as a coach gets that. I think I think that is really cool. Um, you know a lot of people. You know I tweeted this out because I. I've, I know I've talked about it like every every time we do the awards, but I I was getting so many tweets like why didn't you vote for coaching the staff of the split? Like what's up with that? How come you didn't do it? Um, and and for me, this has always been a tough award because I just don't feel like I have enough insight into what's going on in the teams to really like give a, a vote I feel strongly about. Right? I could vote based off of like I can make up some criteria and say okay I'm gonna vote based off of the best drafts, right? And then I can vote for that. But the problem is with most of the teams, you don't really know who, who is leading what. And when you talk to, when I talk to players and I talk to coaches, it is wildly different stories about who's doing what. Sometimes you'll talk to a player and be like, this coach sucks ass. He doesn't do anything. <laughs> he, he's just, he's just ruining our team. You know, and you'll like listen to comms or hear about. Comms I, lo I love, I like, love those conversations, by the way. And, and that's what I base a lot of, a lot of mine off of. I, I try, try, so, so I get like, Oh, the, you know, Kobe talked to X three players, and those are the three that hate this coach. So, whoop, <laughs> I guess he voted against him. Um, yeah, <laughs> you know th that type of stuff does happen. But I love those little like insider. After, that's one of the things that I'm going to miss about. The, uh, they disagree though. Well, yeah, I was I was going to say I'm going to miss the uh, the 
playoff after parties that happen you know like uh riot usually throws like a oh, little yeah. like end of end of the you know thing ended let's say all everybody starts back. drinking a little they everyone get a little starts loose. smack talking <laughs> their team like i don't know why we drafted that in game five it sucked you know like and it's uh it's so cathartic to get everyone's like vent sesh out and uh <laughs> Yeah, I just I just like hovering around, you know, listening to all these stories. So yeah, safe uh, space. Uh, not yeah, gonna not repeat gonna, any of those. Yeah, not, not gonna reveal anything. But it's 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 just interesting, right? Like I like that we have the award. I think it is good to acknowledge um, all the hard work and how much of an impact a good coaching staff has on it. Uh, maybe there's some way we can improve it more, like more well defined the award. Like, is it doing the most with the least? Is it having the best drafts? Like, I think that the award could benefit from like a more specific definition. Uh, but maybe I'm just dreaming. I don't know. I, um, I, I definitely take the other side a little bit because I think a lot of the awards are not super well defined. Um, yeah. You know, like the, the argument that you get with all these like MVP, like rookie of the split, is it the person who, you know, they had the best team around them. So they look the best or is it, you know, what your own personal criteria? And I think that's how coaching staff is for me as well. We have mm-hmm. the least information to your point. Um, you know, we don't get much insight beyond like docs and talking to players if they're willing to share. But I don't think every award has to be this like, perfect i know exactly like the order i think it can be subjective totally and a lot of the times i think the coach of the, the split award is a more narrative award and that's fine like it doesn't have to be this like uh i sat in on every coach coaching session i know who has the biggest brain it's it's an acknowledgement to the fact that tl went from ninth to first you know that's what i see this award as uh and jat being a first-time coach in that situation and these kinds of things maybe if you got two two coaches in a room and had them in the exact same situation you could determine which one coach, was coach. <laughs> yeah you have some weird coach <laughs> off but i don't think that's really what i'm going for when i vote for this because I, I vote for it i'm yeah. usually going for some combination of improvement which is the biggest thing i I'd look up for a staff to do is to make sure that their team is actually getting better um, so I'm looking for improvement. I'm looking for, you know, decent drafts. Like you're saying a little bit, I want to see, uh, the team seems to be getting along and doing well and whatnot. Um, and I've you know, got... TL, TL improved a lot over the course of this split. They cut five minutes off their average win time in the between first half, second half and stuff. Like I've got an I don't idea. feel bad putting Jat number one for me. I've got an idea for content now. Oh God. Coach. <laughs> we, we bring two coaches into a scenario. All right. We've got this player. He just punch the other player's girlfriend in the butt. What do you do? <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> That's not the setting I thought it was going to be. Uh, I don't know. I, I just start say, saying like, words. I just start saying words for a scenario. And that is I a, did. that's a scary he scenario. Punched. I'm like, huh? His girlfriend, what? In the butt? Huh? <laughs> I, I definitely agree that I like the idea of it not being game related, though. Who's going to like manage the little the, the kids the most when they're, they're throwing their tantrums? Yeah. All right. We'll, we'll workshop this. Uh, <laughs> yeah. There was there was also, you know, some, some more stuff that came out this past weekend, um, you know, around 100 Thieves and the criticism they were getting, and, you know, and Poom getting getting flamed. Mark, Mark was in the crosshairs a little bit for this. Um, you know, big bully that Mark is, uh, but you know, and, and I just, I just want to touch on it a little bit, you know, it's, it's less specific to this, uh, this situation, but more just kind of like as a general topic, I, I do think this is a cycle that we sometimes go through in, in gaming and esports and sports in general, uh, where, you know, someone has a bad performance, they get piled on people get a little bit too extreme with the criticism saying like, Oh, retire this, this guy, you know, he's trash, whatever. Maybe it's personal attacks. It gets too extreme. And then there are people condemning those attacks and then people then take that as as license to go and attack the people like that maybe criticized. You know what I mean? It's kind of this weird circle. Um, and I, like with the Poom situation specifically, like I I never will condone personal attacks. I never will condone the the super extreme stuff. But I will say that when you are a pro player in any sport, you are opening yourself up to uh, like criticism. You're opening yourself up to to like to jokes and memes and and this sort of stuff. That is a part of every sport, right? You know, uh, you know, joking about players having bad games, like good games, memeing, having fun. That is fandom. That is sports. And as far as like the the jokes about Poom and the criticism he was getting, to be clear, you know, Poom did literally set some some negative records in in this series. He had the most yeah. deaths ever in a playoff game with ten. He in, in LCS, right? I don't know if this is worldwide. He also had the highest deaths per minute uh, with his his eight death game, I do believe, in that yep. like twenty four minute game, right? So it's not as though um, you know real analysis and criticism wouldn't have even come off as harsh, right? You know, like pe- people all, almost like joking about it and memeing about it. 
uh, I think in some ways was kind of like a lighter way to point to it because you could do the hard hitting analysis of like, this is the worst series ever. And like deaths don't really equate to like performance one-to-one or anything, but this is something that Poom struggled with in the regular season too, where when hundred thieves was playing from behind, he often died a lot more, uh, and, you know, than, than other supports, you know, he struggled on knowing where to go, where to be. Um, but this is a really like, a guy who has not a lot of competitive experience. He had a meteoric rise to LCS. It's super impressive that he was able to get through Academy and, and 100 Thieves next. I think he was even with them for a little bit of time straight into LCS. And we are super excited about his improvement. Um, but I do think that I, I was a bit surprised by by some of the reactions. Like, I, I think my take on it was like, knowing you, Mark, I saw this. I was like, oh, that's a stupid joke. Like, or like, <laughs> or maybe that wasn't that funny, right? But like, I didn't take this as you trying to like, rip on him and be like screw this guy i just took it this is like you know a dumb joke um, it's 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 literally a poop joke you know like he has poo in his name yeah. and and like a shitty me, joke mark <laughs> <pretty crappy. laughs> snaps in point uh you know like it's it, like to me it was i was going for the same energy as and i said this on hotline league and I, there's a there's a longer conversation about it on hotline league that i don't want to go over all of it yeah. but it was the same energy as craps claps caps and dumbs and crumbs and there's like a long history in the league scene of I mean, using someone's nine, name. To, yeah. Like all those kinds of things. Geo and, and two. Yeah. Like, like there's, there's tons of that kind of stuff. And that was the energy I was going for was to put a smile on someone's face. Now I do know that it was used to that. Some people did like quote retweet with some actual like flame at him. And yeah. so that's why I can acknowledge that like, Hey, it did have and probably generated some hate towards him and was used as fodder in some sense. Um, and I don't think you can like, just cause my intentions weren't bad. You can't just separate that from outcome. And so that's why I have no problem apologizing about it. Like, Hey, I didn't, I wasn't trying to start hate on his yeah, timeline and, and, and like, that's not my intent. And like, you're saying people were going too far. It sounds like in, and, and like, if I contributed to that, of course, I'm sorry. But at the same time, I, that was not what I was going for. Like you're saying, it was a dumb poop joke that hopefully like, I, I look forward to like, you know, in a year from now, the same way people meme all of us like there's going to be like hopefully like he comes back he's he's <laughs> popping off you know like you know like i hope that in in a year you know people are able to use this as a funny joke you know not as actual hate because that's that's all we're supposed to be mm-hmm. yeah for me um the reason i like didn't didn't go hard on him and the reason i opened up the casting the series with this is poom's first best of five at any level and, you know, he'd never played one in Academy or, uh, you know, a, a, any like competitive environment and, and bringing up, you know, how how new he is. Then when afterwards, when I, you know, saw everything that was going on, um, there's there's a big difference. Like if we use the Caps Craps example, everybody knows he's an amazing player. He's a world class player. He's one of the best mid laners in the entire world. So it's way easier to joke about him being shit because they're also like, wow, he's also a super good player. Um, It can be most difficult when you are getting slammed already from like a whole bunch of different directions and, and you don't have that confidence and that history to rely on. And, and that's where I like, Oh man, that feels like, big like piling on to to someone that's already getting you know beat, yeah beat I down mean, there, and, and kicked around too. a lot punching up punching down which i totally acknowledge as well uh and i think one of the things too that I probably overvalued was like well if, every time i've talked about poom seriously in every analysis i've done i've caveated it with like hey he dies too much which i said after the the nautilus game after the core jj game when he, he was against bard i always said this is something that's hard for new players to learn he's really young i expect him to improve i hope i hope he does and like acknowledge that these are, you know, it's a different situation. People don't care. They, you know, they see yeah. the, the one tweet and it's like, there you go. That's my entire yeah. thoughts on him. It's like, oh, okay. Yep. And, and at the end of the day, my synopsis is just, I think it's okay to meme, to joke, to like have fun, to make fun of, of casters or players of whatever. Um, yeah. You know, you just have to draw the line at like personal attacks and, and going too extreme, right? You know, going too far with the criticism and stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And and if a lot of people are already making fun of someone, I also don't just jump on because everyone's always like, "Oh, yeah. let me get on well, on that like trade." To be fair, I was the first one who tweeted anything. I tweeted yeah, it I, as not, the game was ending. I was like, "How could I know it was going to turn into a boom hate thing beforehand?" Yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not targeting. To I'm not targeting. Yeah, I know. You, I know. With this. I'm yeah. more replying to people who are saying like, "You're you're yeah. piling on to me," and I was like, "What?" Well, and to be fair, I I, tweet, I tweeted out a scoreline. I didn't say the the poo gang thing, which I think is like got you in hot water. <laughs> yeah, but I, I tweeted out a scoreline, but then I followed up with like, "You know, but on the real." 
like this guy has had a meteoric rise. I'm really excited yeah. to see where, where he at, where he's going to go over the next couple of years. And I think that's true for you. That's true for me. Uh, that's true for really everyone in the scene. You know, we mm-hmm. want more young talent coming up. Hopefully people can joke and criticize without getting too extreme. And hopefully that doesn't dissuade, uh, you know, more yeah. young players. Coming we, up. we had universal praise for dig and immortals and, and hundred thieves for making the more long-term roster moves of bringing in younger players. And I think all of us want to see those kinds of things. All right. 50 minutes in first match. Let's go. <laughs> here we go. Perfect. <laughs> timing. A, qu- a quick 50 minute intro here into the LCS first match of the weekend fly quest and C nine rematch of the spring finals. Been waiting to see C nine. They had a rough last couple of weeks. Then fly quest struggled a little bit, you know, in their series against EG who's going to be for me. I, the first thing I thought of when we are in our story meeting and starting to to write out, uh, you know, some of the ideas for intros and content around this and stuff, I'm just like, there have been we literally have had on camera interviews with Cloud Nine members talking about how they love playing FlyQuest because they're so predictable. They know how they're going to draft and how they're going to play, and their style is exactly what cloud nine as a team like to attack cloud nine as a team with blabber love trying to you know pressure in the early stages and and snowball around moving your mid lane power of evil is a very good resource heavy mid laner he's a Um, turret (laughs) <laughs> and, and and a lot of uh, and and honestly, he has gone a decent way of like kind of uh, of moving the perception of like especially the the turret uh, yeah. <laughs> per, 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 uh, perception and and playing some more assassins and and Rome style champions. But as every player that I talk to that has played with and against him, that that's all always agreed upon, right? He's a resource heavy player, and and if you're on his team that you're going to have to play around, you know, that, that sort of style. And, and cloud nine, they have successfully in the past been able to attack it, but do we think it's getting to the point now with, with FlyQuest rise and they are on now six, uh, all update, but big win streak for, for FlyQuest. And so they're, seven Oh, they're gaining, like um, that. yeah, they're gaining a lot of momentum. Um, and playing a lot better with with multiple threats because Turtle is playing extremely well. I think better than he has played in a long time. And Solo obviously has been pulling his weight uh, for the majority of the split. And af- ever since that Renekton game, everybody has really finally recognized him as a true secondary carry threat. I thought you were actually saying a C nines win streak against FlyQuest. You were talking about FlyQuest regular season. No, streak, I was right? I was trying to reference FlyQuest. Uh, regular season. Okay, yeah, yeah. The uh, regular season was really hot. Regular uh, season win streak that they had. Yeah, but yeah. then they obviously and, went three two against CG, so that they're not on the win streak anymore. But right, in the regular like, season, they, it was like but six they had in been a row or building something. up yeah. all this all this momentum towards the end of the split. Yeah, and that's kind of what I'm talking about, like a, a an end of the split up to yeah. the only the only problem Kobe Just is they fell off against CG. They haven't won a game versus C9 all year. Yeah, uh, zero two in the regular season True. versus them. Uh, I do think well, that's why gone. that's why I set it up with the cloud nine being so heavily advantaged. <laughs> and now your guys like, well, the problem here, Kobe, with yeah, your fly, no, fly like, quest. Well, so you're saying the win streak, but I mean they went three two against CG, right? So they obviously don't know. I mean, so anymore, I hear you. Yeah, and I think uh they did do it even in that series, even though it was three two, they did address some of the things that I think you could have used as 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 ammo against them in the series, is they picked Cog mid, they had Swain mid. They they mm-hmm. were doing some interesting things. Uh, there's one other pick that they did was interesting. I can't remember what it is now. It might have been the bot lane. Oh, uh, Graga support was another one that they, they busted oh, out and looked really good on. off that game. Holy, yeah, yeah, he was insane. Uh, and so I think, uh, they have done some of the things in draft to make it probably a little less paint by numbers when playing against them that that C9 was saying in the regular season. Uh, and C9's mid game has been really bad in the most the recent weeks you know as much as they went 2-0 on their last week it was against i forget it was like dig or clg or something it was not you know it was not the teams that they're really expected to compete with in in, in the playoffs for finals and and for worlds so i'm still very sketched on on c9 uh i want to believe that like this is some best of one struggles and with the time off they'll be able to focus and get comps that work for them again like they seem to have at the start of the split but it's it's just been so long since we've seen them actually be good that I actually have a hard time believing that this will be an easy series at all for it's, them. 
it's that's why it's i think really exciting right because uh people are like well is this a c9 that was struggling are we going to get the c9 that was really on form from all spring and and you know the first half of summer are they just going to be dominant i have heard they're trashing everyone in scrims sometimes people exaggerate that stuff super hard and you hear different things from different sources i also know that solo you know referencing him in the interview right after uh you know he was saying <laughs> that he thinks c9 is the best team he wishes pl tl picked them because tl yeah. you know would be easy peasy and you know c9 is the best team in the league so clearly like that to me was like oh you're not very confident going to into be this fair, though and, i heard that they were doing well in scrims during their slump in the regular season as well yep. uh, doesn't so, always equate to stage results no yeah I've been uh, on teams where we had like 65 plus percent win rate and we did not do well in playoffs in, in gauntlet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, but C9 has always been, I think like, um, well, so I'll say this, they've always been flexible throughout the regular season, you know, whether or not people were happy with the different things that they were showing. I do think that having all these different threats, if you can bring it together is going to be a big advantage at best of five, right? Because it becomes very difficult to actually know exactly what you're going to go for and what you're going to draft. Um, and I've always thought that was an advantage for them. And specifically because they have had such a good matchup against FlyQuest over this entire year, you know, they 3 0 them in spring finals. I don't think they lost them in spring regular season. They didn't lose them in summer regular season. It's you know, that, that alone would be, you know, uh, like seven, seven Oh, I guess. Right. Um, and, and they have kind of had their number. So uh, I do still feel like they're, they're probably going to be coming into this pretty comfortably. Yeah. I do think though, um, like moving into the EG series that FlyQuest had them at showing the swing that early um, and everyone going, Oh yeah, that is a good, you know, Galio counter to these teams that want to initiate on you. Mm -hmm. um, and these big AOE fights that, that is a tool that they've already shown. That is a really good tool versus cloud nine because yeah. Cloud9 and, and Niski have looked so much better when he is on champions like that. Um, obviously, he also has the Zoe, which they've been able to use super well for, uh, you know, picking people off and, um, you know, mid-game uh, poke and stuff like that. But that that was also a big part of, of Cloud9's play style. And they even said themselves, like, some of the uh, matches where they're like, all right, we brought out the big guns, the Galio and Callista now. Um, and those are the types of things that, um, you know, FlyQuest... FlyQuest are, are more ready now, but Cloud9 have also seen some of the things already shown on the table with them having to play versus CG. I also think uh, individual matchups aren't bad for FlyQuest um, in a lot of ways. Like, I, I think I put Santor, I put Santor on over Blabber even um, in, mm -hmm. in the uh, all pro voting. Uh, so I think he he can help control Blabber because Blabber was still having good early games, even in the slumps. So like I think he can control those those early games. Top lane's tough. Uh, Solo doesn't usually get like a ton of help. He's he's kind of on like you get what you get and then you play your lane phase. Sorry, and Licorice does get some help. So I, I think if they can stabilize their top side of the map, bot lane for C9 doesn't do a ton in the early game, um, mm -hmm. and it kind of might allow Ignar to roam a lot. So like I think there are some openings for FlyQuest to actually uh, win this series through. Uh, uh jungle like almost like more of a controlled game plan and then letting ignar have those kind of gragas games where he's all over the map i th i really think santorin is in a position to to cement his place as this you know juggernaut jungler of the mm -hmm. north american lcs i've been watching i've been spectating a lot of uh challenger players solo queue santorin um it just ones at the at the very top and santorin has been spamming and crushing a lot of these solo queue games where both teams are filled with several LCS players and several Academy players. Yes, there's sometimes a, a couple of randoms in there, um, you know, that, that aren't placed on a team, but they're all very high up on the ladder. And every single game that, that I've watched has been, I've been, been so impressed by, by Santorin's individual play, playing a lot of aggressive stuff too, playing so many carries. So with the the last game of that EG series, him finally pulling out the graves, you know, yeah. it's like volley bear, volley bear, volley bear, volley bear, graves, boom, carry, you know, carry game for Santorin, and and seeing some of these solo Q games where he's playing a lot of carries, I like, hmm, maybe this is the series where we see you know FlyQuest actually going carry jungle to carry jungle, and and that makes me super excited. I think for me, this series is going to be so much about mid lane and mid jungle. 
Uh, I, I just think that it's like, you know, to, to your point, Mark, you know, C9 does give more help to top lane, but I feel like it's usually, you know, Nisky and Blav were right. rolling up and making these three man plays. So I think that, you know, a, a pick like this way, and if you can get that type of pick that, that is really like hard, hard winning on the lane, um, and have a winning TV2 in jungle. Like if you can lock Nisky under the turret, I, I, that is a way that I can see FlyQuest winning this series, right? Because your point, Cloud9's mid game team fighting hasn't been good lately, right? And maybe they clean this up and maybe this is a Cloud9 that, that won a championship in spring and it's not close. Who knows? But if we're seeing this Cloud9 that we have seen over the last couple of weeks that looks mortal, I do think that locking Nisky in lane has been the key to a lot of teams beating them. If you can keep this guy under control, if you can keep this guy, you know, locked down. I don't think PoE has to roam to match him. I think that, you know, if you get PoE a winning matchup where he's stable and can push in, um, then that can take away a lot of Nisky's agency and, and perhaps, you know, be a key to victory for FlyQuest. Because I do think that FlyQuest has some strong laners, and especially if Turtle and Ignar are playing like they have been and Solo can hold up. I think there's a, a lot of ways that theoretically FlyQuest, you know, could stabilize in the early game and maybe win fights around dragon or win fights around mid game and then get something done there um but i do think it's going to be an uphill battle for them because you know stylistically it does feel like cloud nine you know pushes them more than they are ready to react and, and that's kind of been the case throughout this entire year um where cloud nine you know is just constantly forcing plays and, and fly quest isn't always up up to the task of, of playing at that speed you know they like to play a more controlled slower game so uh, i think this is going to be a really interesting one and, and it's also i think going to dictate a lot of how people feel like going forward right if, if cloud nine wins this but really struggles i think people are going to be probably well it's going to depend on the tl series but i think people are probably going to have tl as like favorite to win the split you know um and if c9 can really impress um then i think that's going to change a lot of people's opinions perhaps on the strength of the org going forward and people could be quick to forget some of those struggles in the last couple of weeks and historically uh it's funny that you mention it, like the difference in speed and the forcing of plays from cloud nine side, the difference hasn't been Santorin and blabber. The, the difference has been in the past, the Nis Nisky mid lane mm -hmm. being the difference in the pressure and POE trying to, to pressure him and push him in lane and Nisky just leaving anyway and making that side lane play. So plus in the regular season, remember the first time they played with Turtle, I can't remember the second game, but the first time they played FlyQuest, they had that bad invade where Blabber got three of them killed, like three for one or something. Uh, and then it was their insane mid game that actually let them get back into the game uh, mm -hmm. and, and their better skirmishing. So I'm wondering, you know, if they lose that advantage and their skirmishing isn't up, to, you know, isn't quite there and they make some of these mistakes. No, I think it's actually pretty close. Are we doing, are we doing predictions on this or? Sure. All right. Someone else go first. Uh, I I just so I could be way off on this. I'm saying three zero cloud nine. Uh, oh wow! I do, I do believe that with with the strength that FlyQuest showed, I think FlyQuest looked a lot weaker than I was expecting. Uh, you know, with with them against EG, I thought they were going to trash EG. I thought they were going to look, you know, really bulletproof. And that's and because that you thought EG were like your EG. You had yeah. them so low. I know. But you had the worst I, I think team. That, I think that FlyQuest looked way worse than they did in the regular season. Then EG looked EG better looked as well. Better. So yeah. I think it was a combination. It wasn't just uh -huh. EG playing up. I think it was like was playing worse. That in combination with the fact that they have not beaten C9 a single time in this entire year. Solo seemed extremely concerned about the matchup. And stylistically, I think that it is concerning. Plus C9 has had so much time to prep specifically for this team that has been predictable in draft. I think that smells like a sweep. Um, I hope I'm wrong and that it is competitive. But that's what I'm feeling. I... So I am also going cloud nine, but I really think the three zero is super overreaching. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think I it's, I do think it's going to be way closer and you keep referencing like the normal, normal season cloud nine, uh, beating them in the first game. It was Oriana in or first game was the Corky into LeBlanc. And then the second game was the Oriana into Galio. Mm -hmm. So like both of them, they're at the roaming disadvantage and POE is playing, the one that's you know more confined to lane has to scale up. Like Corky in particular needs needs two items, um, and uh, and then that's the other one you're ver versus the Galio, and they've they have shown to to evolve a little bit more to try and counter in that direction. So I think it's going to be closer. I'm still saying Cloud Nine because I still think the the stylistic Give difference the is, score, Kobe. Yeah, is too games. much. My game score would be three two. Okay. And maybe that's very, also very wishful thinking because we've had back-to-back -back three zeros that were 
you know, less, less than ideal, less, less than we're looking for in the entertainment. Uh, but I really think this is going to be a super entertaining, close series. And I'm still going cloud nine. I'm going cloud nine. I'm also going three, two. The only thing that makes me think it's more towards the Zales point is about the scrims thing um, and the volatility of best of ones. And yeah, you know, a number of, of factors that could have made their, their regular season ending look worse on stage than it really was. That's my biggest concern of, of like why I would be wrong, but I, I scrim, hope scrims I'm lie. Just things I've been hearing. And, and the I'm going to tell you, Zale, you're wrong. It's not going to be a 3-0. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, we'll find out. We, got we might not be right, here. but neither will a Zale. <laughs> yeah. We got, it's going to be a 3-1, and we're both wrong. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Golden Guardians versus TL. Uh, we're going to jump into this one here. Golden Guardians. You know, I, I talk about maybe FlyQuest stock went down after their first round, uh, their first round performance. Golden Guardian stock definitely went up, right? You know, TSM, I think. Had yeah, a that's some Tesla stock right there. Golden yeah, they're, they're, <laughs> to the moon, baby. Uh, TSM, you know, TSM played down, but Golden Guardians also, I think, you know, did improve. They looked more impressive. I think that they came in with a really intelligent plan. My big question for this series is, like, can you solve TL in the way that they solved TSM? Mm -hmm. I think that they are a more solid team than TSM. And I think that is going to be the big difficulty here for Golden Guardians because TL plays slow, they play standard, and they have five really, really good players. And, and that just doesn't feel solvable to me. Like, I don't see how you get this, like, big pick band advantage against a team that's always playing the same way and always playing, you know, they just don't make a lot of mistakes. They're just really good at it. Uh, I'm with you. Uh, I, I love golden guardians. And if I'm being honest, I, I probably like, I went back and like rethought about how I talked about them and in, in on the dive and hotline league last week. And I realized I probably said more good things about them than TSM. I love a lot of their players. I had them like actually higher rated in four out of five positions, you know, and Devonte well, has been to world. So much. No, no, no I, that's what I'm saying. It's like, <laughs> for some reason, I still can't ever pick them. Cause I feel still really, really strongly about like, I think Hanser has a more diverse champion pool that could maybe be used to get advantages on, you know, we're talking about solving, you know, like you can kind of know what impacts probably going to play and prepare a couple counters in the top lane. I think Hanser is someone who is, is really good in lane and can potentially get an advantage there. Bot difference is not going to go the same way. Uh, you know, it won't be like core JJ doesn't have an answer to, to Morgana, but yeah. I still think that their bot lane could actually win, win the matchup over a, a five game series and just in general have, have more good performances. Um, I think core JJ will, will obviously he's the front runner. I think for a lot of people's MVP, he'll probably still pop off in the series. Um, and jungle is, is, I think, the biggest mismatch in the entire in, in the entire series, which is also in favor of Golden Guardians. So once again, I can like hype them up in my mind a ton about why I think that they should actually potentially do well into TL, and so then why, I'm still going to pr predict TL. Why do you Why do you think they lose so much then? If you th do, you just think that they're a, a good individuals but a bad team? Like why? Like so, if if you're so excited about this team, why were they nine and nine? I don't think that they have good mid game shot calling and decision making, uh, which was compounded in the regular season with their over indexing into early game drafts. Um, I think that they drafted like those kind of nidally, uh, Jace kind of esque comps a bunch of times or Jace for Hanser and these kinds of things. I don't think they need to do that. I think you, your players are naturally good enough to kind of get early game advantages without indexing into it. And then I don't think that they have a great shot caller. Like it's probably not closer. It's probably not Demonte. It's probably not FBI. Hanser seems okay. Who he's probably okay, but I don't think that they're this great mid game shot calling team, which is one of the problems against TL, who is probably the least error prone team in the league right now uh which is why i'm still going with tl but i think that they golden guardians often in the regular season misread the meta and then shot themselves in the foot a number of times um that's I my big jump, spiel i want to jump on hyping up golden guardians as well yeah. um even though my prediction is going to be <laughs> in favor of team liquid <laughs> because i them up and then being like 303 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. because they did start out one and four, and and so it has been a constant split of improvement for the Golden Guardians. Except for the last weekend, right? Where they kind of reverted. which, but they which, went back to, the to Mark's league. point, Azale. To Mark's point, they played two Renekton Nidalee games, both mm -hmm. super early game, trying to snowball off of that. Lost both of those games. Those were those were the two main losses at the end of the split. That was your drop off. And to Mark's point. It does seem like they learned from that because in their series then versus TSM, they never once 
tried to over index on that again. They 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 threw that out the window and they went with Hanser on one of the most self-sufficient top laners that there is, Mordekaiser two games, and then Gangplank, the other one. <laughs> uh, and with DeMonte on Ziggs, Ziggs, Oriana. So so they they kind of threw a lot of that loss strategy out the window. And I think they adapted really well, this being on new patches as, as well, being able to incorporate shifts in your overall team play, I, I think is really promising heading through best of five series. Plus, they're all going to be in a very good mindset. We've been discussing the the mental game for a lot of these series, you know, how how difficult it's going to be from TSM, having to you know come back and play with confidence versus a lot of these teams. Golden Guardians are going to be the ones with the puffed up chest right now. They're like, mm-hmm. you give, give me credit. You've been not giving me enough credit before. I'll show you now, right? And and after uh, you know, 3-0 of Team Liquid, they can stomp on the ground and be like, we're proving it now. So I can definitely see them just playing with the utmost confidence and now also showing flexibility in strategy. Um, does make me super confident, as well as, of course, who he FBI playing super well. Hanser, I think, to me, with so much focus being on the bottom lane, it's, he was great. It's been rightfully show. I think Hanser was a monster yeah. versus his old team versus TSM. He was uh, clapping people all over the place, and without a lot of help, as usual. You know, he throughout the season tracking his jungle proximity, he has either been last or like second to last for a- almost every week. Uh, playing a lot of weak side. Mark's here. Oh, hello. Uh, Golden Guardians? Yeah. Uh, this, this is me. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to need an extra uh, $1,000 here to, to talk you up for another segment. Um, you only the, bought The offer wasn't, well, it wasn't high enough. I'm still going, to, uh, still going TL. <laughs> I tried. He's calling in buying some Golden Guardians. Hello, Mark. Check right your now. bank account. This is Steve. I'd like you to retract your statement on the All Golden right, you, Guardians. You, you've, you've got the odds higher for, for Golden Guardians now, so bet TL. <laughs> 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 I'm rigging it. Um, no, I still think, sorry, to, to, to I don't know where we were when I, I took that. Uh, to talk about TL, though, like, they are so good in every single lane. And Tactical uh, is is a beast. I don't think he's going to, I don't think the ball is going to run into the same problems like we were saying. And Core JJ will have a much bigger, like, the, probably the biggest difference in, in the series will be Core JJ. He's he, he needs people need to remember that he was did literally. Did Core JJ winning. put who he as his vote for top support? He did. That's some that was him right like, there. Being like he's better. I don't think yeah, so. Maybe I don't think <laughs> so. Um, I I think at the end of the day, I'm excited about Golden Guardians' improvement. I do agree that their 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 pick band I think was a lot more solid against CSM. I just you know I, I can't get past that. I think that they. They even talked about in interviews how for TSM, Fjergsen doesn't carry, they don't win, right? Clear pick ban strategy, all bans thrown towards him. One of the games, he got five bans against him. It worked, you know, double lift and, and treats didn't step up in the bot lane. They didn't have carry threats elsewhere to actually, you know, take over the game. But this, this, this sort of strategy just doesn't work against TL. You just have to outplay TL. And that is where I think TL being so solid is going to be such a tremendous advantage for them because TL just doesn't make mistakes. And this is going to challenge Golden Guardians not only in the lightning phase, it's going to challenge their mid-game shot calling, their the ability to close games, because TL will almost always draft for a really strong team fighting team. They make very few mistakes. They have strong laners across the board. And that is why I think it's it's about so much more in this series than just the individual talent of Golden Guardians. I think that you know TL kind of trumps them in their ability to to make calm decisions and to play make you know in the mid game and the late game it does feel like that is where there's a huge advantage to TL side uh, and I think that you really need to have something special to to be able to best TL in a series uh, because I think that you know any of their lanes really can can w- like win them the game and I just don't see like who who are you supposed to ban out you know it just doesn't feel like there's anything obvious to do against TL except ban the strongest meta champions because they're going to draft meta and they're going to play you know slow scaling style so you ban out Caitlyn you ban out whatever you think is most OP but like there, there's no player to target yeah I mean Golden Guardians ran into some big game problems still, even with this, you know, later game scaling focus. They still, I think it was game two or game, I can't remember, game one or game two. They lost like a 4K gold lead and kind of went yeah. to even. TSM is not even a great mid game team. So when you go up against a great mid game team and you stall out like that, it's going to feel a lot worse, I think, which is why 
I'm still TL. I'll go three one. I think Golden Guardians will 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 steal steal a game here, but that's the most I can do for them. <laughs> that's your that's best the most. Uh, wait, Mark. I, th- I think you're getting another call. Uh, uh, best I can do is one game. Ah, three two, three two. What did I say? Uh, <laughs> I'm going three one. I, I'm uh, the same. Uh, hello. I think I'm gonna be. I'm. I'm bumping it up to a three two. For for oh. me, I'm actually gonna go oh, wow. uh, three two for for Golden Guardians. Okay. Um, wait, what? You Golden because, Guardians gonna win? Or excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> it's still four team liquid, but I'm bumping up <laughs> the Golden yeah. Guardians. How much is in your paper? Wait, what? Yeah, yeah, still team liquid. Uh, because you're like, oh yeah, they have all these strong laners, you know, and they're gonna be just fine on their own. But the jungle, do you think that? Closer is going to be able to create more than Brox is going to be able to create, oh. either in invading, which you would assume would have to come from drafting a winning lane side of the map and using that side. Uh, so you have to be cognizant of that, or trying to snowball and get a specific lane ahead. I think I'm- he'll create more, but I don't think they'll hold on to the lead. Like, you know, and, and I don't expect them to just win 2v2 bot lane. I don't expect them to, you know, just like automatically win any of these lanes, right? So I think that if Closer has a slight advantage, I don't think it matters. Golden Guardians has been pretty poor at playing from ahead for the most part. And Brox's like bad games are not like other people's bad just games. Farms. Yeah, right. Like his bad game is like, oh, he just didn't seem to have an influence on it. Not like he had a negative influence. Whereas, except for the one Closer game, actually, you got Flame Horizon to buy Closer on Italy, but then they still. Golden Guardians yeah. got Soul and then lost that game. And that was like game. That was like the second game of the was, split yeah, for TL. So it was. So right it was. It was, it was. A lot of things are different now. And I think, unless there's some unique ban strategy that gets rid of some stuff that you know is in uh, Brox's pool, but not in closers, and creates an even bigger mismatch. I just don't think Brox is going to be getting killed in the jungle and fall out of relevancy, which is I feel like what closer would need to do to him to to be able to upset how I think this series will go. Yeah, hoping- I think I think the top lane is actually pretty interesting too is like both both Hanser and impact have shown this prevalence for mordekaiser now i mean with Hanser now jumping on the on the train too that's that's one of his big picks everybody's hyper vigilant of the shen and that Great might answer. even be something that's that's drawing bands to your point of like oh targeting mm-hmm. people like that to me is like the a specific one champion that you would want to target versus yeah versus a bag versus uh you're saying because it's I, not I like you're, you're putting him like though. oh he can't play any other stuff but I feel like it's very necessary to strong meta that champion that he plays really well. I feel it. like if you're if you want to play more though, you just let Shen go through. Because that's a great answer. Yeah, it's it's just scary that that they haven't been able to like successfully pull that off. Because I would agree, like match up great, um, you know, and and that should that should be on paper playable. But uh, impact undefeated on Shen. Still, uh, yeah, you can lose, lose like win game on Shen, obviously. Yeah, but you know, he's been so good with the Mord, uh, like denying smites and stuff from the jungler. So it's interesting. Mord, I could definitely see rising in priority. It feels like Mord in general has been successful, very successful in playoffs, mm-hmm. um, especially when you're playing for Dragon Soul and your jungler can just get ulted and then you have an un- uncontested smite. You know, that'll be pretty interesting. Uh, I'm excited for both these series. Uh, go ahead, Mark. Oh, it was really minor. I just like the proto belt tech as well for yeah. for those kinds of plays. Uh, I thought that was really good by Hauntzer, which not a ton of people do. The mini gap closer. It also helps with the push a lot, which which can be nice pressure lane. Uh, but I'm 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 gonna go. I think three one as well. You know, I'm I'm hoping that Golden Guardians comes up with something spicy. Uh, I think the Ziggs pick was great against TSM. If they can get really creative and, and find some answers that people weren't expecting, I think that would be a, a way in. You know, if they can find some way to really abuse bot lane two v two, that would be a way in. Um, but I think it's going to take something special for them because TL is so solid. I think that they have been the most solid team, you know, in the league. So uh, I think they're a, a tough nut to crack. Mark's <laughs> massive notes with me here. I, I pass notes when I, the teacher's My talking. fingers were one off to the right on my Yimmer. keyboard. What is Yimmer? And it came out as gibberish. <laughs> Welcome to the Honda MVP section. Wow, my wow, friends. Wow, wow, wow where we released the uh top 10 um now uh that's so the top 10 for the uh honda mvp voting who do you think is most likely i think we're all still gonna say like core jj yeah um but i i like including all of the top 10 because we get to give some credit around as far as uh the snubs with this this year you guys both talked 
explicitly about how many people are getting snubbed in every single role. So let me let me read out the top 10. And this is uh, at LCS official on Twitter. If you guys want to find that, it's pretty easy to find on the Twitter. Um, but Bjergsen, Blabber, Closer, Corja J, Impact, Jensen, Licorice, Power of Evil, Santorin, and Someday are the top 10. Notably, three TL players, two FlyQuest, two C9. Um, and then you have, you know, Closer, Someday, and Bjergsen all sneaking in there as solos from their squads. Um, so what do we want to predict here? Who, who we think is going to win or who's going to get axed? Who do we think is going to get axed? How about who's axed first? Cause I think we all have the top pretty soon. Well, where are they moving to next? Right. Is it going from 10 to what? Cause I mean, I 10 think to, 10 to five, if it's going 10 to five, I mean, I, I think, I think you can start by saying who you think the top three is going to be for me. Um, the top three would be, you know, core JJ, probably Bjergsen Labber. If I had to say who I think is going to be after that for top five, I would probably say maybe Jensen and Santorin added in there. Something like that would be my guess. Um, I maybe think someday. Some, I think someday gets a lot of votes too. Yeah. 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 But he he didn't he didn't even win uh, you know uh, first team All Pro, so maybe he'll get less than Licorice, right? Yeah, but he got but second. It's team. I think some something that happens too is like the people who put him first team will guarantee to have put him for MVP, whereas That's people right. who put yeah. Licorice first team might not have put him MVP. So. It's it's one of those weird like weird voting things like can happen like that, um, uh, which I know sometimes people freak out like how this guy get more MVP votes but also, be lower. I I don't I don't think Licorice is actually going to get a lot of the MVP votes because most people that would have him super high for top are going to have a different Cloud Mind member as their MVP. Yeah, yeah. I think Impact Licorice Closer, you know, Power of Evil are all going to fall out for sure. And yeah, I'm surprised Impact's one. even in there at all, to be honest. Like clo- closer to your point, Mark, like maybe the people that voted him high will still will still vote for him for MVP, but he was third team, right? So I don't think there's going to be enough of them to really have him in the you know in the in the top running for MVP. I like yeah. that the that all these players are getting representation though, uh, yeah. You know, yeah, including including top ten because they've all been so such good players and really important to their individual teams. What's it's interesting also- too is there's four top laners. Well, and look right. at mid and jungle. All, all of Three? all pro right, for mid count. and jungle are both in there, right? Yeah. Like we have we have uh, power power of evil, Bjergsen, Jensen. That's your top three for all pro. Blabber, Licorice, someday. Santorin. Licorice impact someday. Also yeah, top we have, three. We have three top threes and then a support. No marksman <laughs> players in in there and one support, right? So I guess bot lane, uh, you know, irrelevant. Doesn't matter. There you go. <laughs> it's funny that. All of the other ones are are three representatives, and it's just Core JJ. Yeah, because I think that also splitting the vote. If you're like deciding between one of these other lanes, it, Core JJ answer is so easy because yeah. he's so high up there for the supports, and that was represented in the support voting. That's true. where he had the most ginormous lead, most like the biggest gap between him and second place and third. He place. He also had the most all pro votes in first team as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I think it's a really good point because if you're like, Ooh, jungle's the most impactful role. My MVP may be from there. There's going to be more cannibalizing um, between like people who are like Beards and Jensen or people who are saying, no, no, no closer or Santor and a blabber or whatever. If you're, if you're considering core JJ, core JJ kind of stands alone. I mean, I think he's for sure going to be the MVP. I don't think it's actually going to be close. Yeah. I don't think so either, but we'll pretend it will be. <laughs> It'll be interesting, and we could be wrong. You know, I was surprised by some of the stuff in the in the All Pro, uh, but that is pretty hype. We now have some Twitter questions. We're gonna hop into this first one. Comes from Michael Gums, I believe. Uh, <laughs> do you think Ash should be reworked into a damage support uh, like Pike and Senna? And what are your thoughts in general on damage supports without having nurse? They usually get played in the support role. They usually I, never get played in the support role. Excuse me. I would rather an a new champion be designed designed in that fashion then rework i think ash is uh is really cool right now i feel like she has a very unique identity and if we are taking that and turning it into a damage support i feel like we would lose one of the utility information gathering marksmen and and putting it into a support role so i understand where the question is coming from because We've all had those people playing support Ash and being like, "Oh yeah, my hawk shot and uh, you know arrow or the I'm for and stuff like that." And you're kind of like, ah, "Okay, I'm not gonna dodge, but I have this weird feeling." In my- <laughs> I'm not gonna dodge, but I should have dodged. <laughs> um, but maybe if hawk shot max was the thing, like maybe if there was like more of a benefit, then it, it, without removing it from 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 like AD, you could also make it like, "Oh, you know, maybe there's some sort of thing there." 
um, that allows you to to like want to play it as a support sometimes. I don't know. That, that's kind of why I want it designed as a new champion yeah. with focus on information gathering. Because information gathering, I think, is a cool and more unexplored area. And give that would shot. be the reason why you... Give him Swain's you... W. Give him <laughs> all the that's long all is, just these Frank, together. Just a Frankenstein? <laughs> just shooting out things like 2,000 units away for vision. Has Gets no ability to deal Calista with damage. W, the Sentinel starts just walking out. <laughs> yeah, he just has Swain W, Calista W, and Hawkshot. And What's their ultimate alt? is, I don't know. Your ultimate Quinn? is a really big sweeper. Oh, it's Quinn's like <laughs> W, but it just goes through half the map. <laughs> it's pulse. just the whole map. <laughs> uh, I, I see I, you. Now what? <laughs> I found them. I'm going to die. <laughs> um, I think uh, I agree. Like, I don't want to push everything that's somewhat utility in the bot lane into becoming a support. I know that's yeah. not what that is a bit of a slippery slope argument, but I think Ash is in a really cool spot right now as this kind of utility marksman um, that scales kind of well has different build paths and mm -hmm. is probably one of, in my opinion one of the best designed and balanced 80 carries and i wouldn't want to tank that for an experimental idea all right next question here this one comes from rumble stew this is actually our executive producer uh for lcs he says listen to the dive wall during a 12.5 mountain bike or, or 12.5 <laughs> mile mountain bike ride this morning when i finished they were still talking these guys never shut the fuck up and i wouldn't have it any other way well you're in for a treat uh. dave because this one's probably just as long of an episode yeah I'm we you, are I'm glad you didn't say stfu you just drop it <laughs> It, yeah, there, well, I can blame I, he, him. He can't. He, he can't find me. He's got to find himself. He's the one who tweeted this to us. That's what I was going to say. The best part of that question is that Azale is allowed to drop an f bomb yeah. because it's our executive producer putting <laughs> putting it in in his script. Really can find Dave. All complaints directed to Rumble <laughs> Yeah. So I'll also say I'm more impressed in the amount of time it took him to do a 12 and a half mile mountain bike ride. More so than the dive. The dive is like what 90 minutes. He did that in an hour and a half. Then. I don't know much about biking. Is that impressive? I think that sounds know. impressive to me. I we're mean, almost I think at 90 minutes right now, by anyway. the way. I, we're almost at 90 minutes right now for this one. So I'm impressed, yep. Dave. That's all I'll say. Good job, Dave. Keep it up. All right. Anchor questions. We got them. This one is uh, from last week because we promised we would have a, a little bit of, of, of those questions popped in since we didn't get to them last week. This one comes from David Slavic. What pro series would you guys use to introduce a casual league friend into the world of pro esports? I know there's a lot of good ones like SKT versus Rocks in the world semifinals, but I don't really know which one to pick. Also, Azale, my last name is pronounced Slavic. What did I say? You, Slavic? I don't Slavic? Know. I'm not sure what I said. You I said remember. you said something said slightly different. You're you're okay. slightly off. I think you were off on maybe the the A. Uh, Slavic. But, yeah. Um. All right. And I like that he preempted it. <laughs> he was like, yeah, he's going to say it wrong. But I already read his name by the time I heard it. You also, know? we mix up who reads these sometimes. And you happen to read this one. So you he got, he got a little lucky on that, too. It. No, it's not me. <laughs> uh, so the interesting thing about this is historic games look weird now. When I go back and rewatch them with all the graphics mm -hmm. update and champion kit updates and all this stuff. Uh, so like... SKT rocks. I haven't rewatched it in like at least a year or two, other than like the highlights of like the the Ash era. Whoa. I did a year ago because we had a we did a feature on it. Did and it hold up? It, looked, like, it, it still looked good to me, but obviously it's not going to have elemental rift changes and stuff like that. So yeah, my, not so those, but like just in general, some of the models and things, you know. Yeah. Effects. I, I, I was still going to be like, yep, that that's the one for me. That, that's that's what I w would recommend. But I kind of like your point of it having to be more recent so that it, it does look more similar. Because because my my pick would be an older one, actually. It would be, I think it was, I, I might mess this up. I think it was KTA versus Samsung Blue. I think it was 2015 summer. It was the one that was a five-game series, went back and forth, and they both went into the blind pick Yasuo, but they built differently and played differently, where one was like the aggro Bork Yasuo, and the other one was the slower mm -hmm. IE rush, and they fell behind. And like KTA was this insane early game team, and Samsung Blue was this insane late game team, and every every game felt it was like riding the edge of like, can they get enough of a lead? Can they hold on? Uh, that was a sick, sick series. I don't have like a specific one in mind, but for me, I think that the best way to introduce new players is, is action back series, lots of kills, you know, like lots of stuff going on. It's harder to appreciate. I think the subtleties and like the macro and like, yeah. more like kind of ethereal style. <laughs> um, 
So I, I would definitely recommend the the really kind of like hyped up action pack series. The I, ethereal style. I don't know. You know what I mean? The more like <laughs> ephemeral, ethereal, <laughs> intangible. Uh, I know what you mean. Yeah, what, what was, was a, a 20, 2018 FPX versus, was it KT in uh, semi or uh, quarterfinals where they had like the back door and they almost can't, it was, it looked like it was going to be a sweep, but then. Mm-hmm. It wasn't a sweep as a five game series. Is that is that the one I'm thinking of? That could be a good one too. Yeah, that'd be a good one. I would also definitely use one that has big crowd noise. Uh, because I think that yeah. really draws people in, fakes makes them associate it closely with other live events that um, you know, they already have kind of good good feelings towards where whatever kind of live event it is, with when you have a big audience and you feel all this emotion you're like i don't know what's happening but i'm emotional too i'm excited also what are we doing guys yeah it's <laughs> something some, cool is happening <laughs> someone find a good kobe one Co- one of the ones like the the tsm I never CLG doubted that. Packs, the pax one or whatever that was in like 2014 i think there's there's a hype one <laughs> we uh we could go back and find which gifts of like casters are jumping around the most because after all these action pass series they got into a um strategy of like releasing the cameras of us yeah and it would always be like surprising to us too and there'd be like ones of us like (gasps) jumping up and down or like slamming the table and stuff but they always started doing that after they saw the success of some of those you know older hype ones that you're talking about but ever since then they they have a bunch of those all right well if you want the hype crowd you gotta watch whales whales true whales it's whales all right next one here comes from lucas karstens Hey guys, my name is Lucas, calling in from Washington, D.C., and I want to hear what you guys think the most iconic champion that Riot has ever released is, and why, and then just for fun, uh, who do you guys think is the most forgettable champion in the game currently? Ooh, my my thought for competitive is immediately Lee Sin. That's the one that jumps to mind. I, I was talking competitive. I think Lee Sin, for a lot of people, just hit the skill expression, all the, like, people all, is a he is the jungler. Every jungler learns Lisa. Is he still the most popular? I know for a long time it was actually the you most popular rate-wise? champion in all of League of Legends. I can too. check right now. Uh, or, he, well, I don't know about like what metric, but if you're talking play rate, I can check play rate. There was a period of time I think he Caitlin was because he's the most played actually by a lot right now. Well, I Caitlin mean, you're right. li- are you sorting at you're sorting by rank as well though? Aren't you looking at just rank? Oh, okay, because I, mean, I, I was talking about literally in League of Legends games most. Most popular champion, uh, like including unranked, unranked had, stuff. Yeah, it was back. Uh, it was back when they had normal. Still, games Caitlin, even with a, a, for unranked, it's still Caitlin. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but uh, Leeson is is still really really popular. Yeah, um, I was gonna say the other one. I think for for iconic could just be Ari. Like mm-hmm. she's probably the most popular champion in the greater, you know, ecosystem of of League of Legends and gaming. Whereas Leeson, no one no one really knows who Leeson is outside League fans. And I think. That's that could true. be a, an argument to be made. They need to put Lee Sin in a music video. Yep. Not fair. You want to make those skin bucks. You also need to make, make, make it an attractive cosplay character, which <laughs> Lee Sin is hard to pull off for a lot of dudes. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> I'm not ripped. I can't do it. <laughs> All right. Uh, the most forgettable. Hmm. <laughs> you forgot. <laughs> yeah. Think quick. Think of the most forgettable thing. What's the uh, thing that you don't remember? <laughs> Honestly, it has to be one of the like uh you know one of the boring champion kits, but a lot of those are first in line for re- reworks. Uh, well, and they're also beginner champs. There's got to be like Alawi. That's yeah. my answer. Alawi What's the lowest like, play rate? Just look at lowest play lowest rate. play rate is Alawi. is pretty. Low. I was gonna what? guess Aurelian Soul or something. Uh, Talia is the lowest play rate right now in both normals and ranked. Um, Aurelian Soul is Alawi because so uh, Alawi also so doesn't like jump around or anything. You know, it's very rare to have a champion that doesn't uh, have dashes. <laughs> you and can, it, and you get a mini dash in your in your queue. It's also <laughs> just like Alawi didn't even have a moment. You know yeah. what I mean? I feel like no one ever cared about Alawi. It was it never had like there's like a yeah. couple times in pro play where it was like a niche counter pick, but it never had yeah. like an Alawi meta. It like it's been a good champion at times. Over buff like, Alawi. But just no, no. I feel like no one ever cared. I've never heard anyone talk about like Sikalawi skins or it being like. She's. Yeah. I, I know you guys talked about before about the riot having the philosophy of like we're gonna make a champion maybe a little overtuned on on release so people actually get to play it and see if it's their champion. You know, because uh, if it comes out and it's weak, people might not even pick it up. I wonder if Alawi was the blueprint for why they did that because. 
A lot of like strong. Saying, she Still never had her it. moment though. She never had her yeah. moment. Whereas yeah. every other champ feels like it's had a moment. Mm. Do you guys have a better answer? Agree. No. Um, agree. If it wasn't for flowers, I would try and <laughs> Scarner. <laughs> say like yeah. Scarner. Yeah, or... but he's but Scarner he's been... was really popular and competitive for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Remember, U- no quick silver sash. He is down. <laughs> <laughs> Udyr has a a big place in my heart. So also, he was it. there in the beginning. You know, like maybe he's fallen out of relevancy, but yeah. I, honestly, I'm on board with Alawi. Yeah. I, I, unless there's York. What about York? Because he got a rework, and people still don't play him. I feel yeah, like but he's more of a niche popularity. And I mean, he's he's now probably as popular as Larry, but he did have the moment when it was targeted Q and, or E and E and W or whatever, the, whatever his old one was, where his E healed him, and you just built mana item, and you just E people over and over in lane. Mm. And he was I think actually York like, is my is my best possible other answer. But he at yeah. least had a moment in competitive. Yeah. Okay. All right, we got one more here. I do believe this one is from Thomas Lukashow. Hey guys, uh, so after the results of this past week, everyone agrees Doublelift did not look great. Uh, we've been argued that he has been just as serviceable AD this split, but with roster swaps, I guess that's probably a bit harder to argue right now. But with that said, my question is, is Doublelift only worth having on your team if you have dedicated tools around him? Uh, caller goes on to ask, you know, is, Dub- is double if wasted also on TSM if they're not playing around him a, a little bit? Um, what do you guys think? Um, I, I mean, if you're expecting, if you're expecting 1v9 carry of a game double lift, then I guess you could say it's wasted on a team that isn't going to like be camping for bot and, and playing with a lane dominant support and all this sort of stuff. I can see that argument, but that's also kind of saying that it's like, it's not valuable to just have a good player, even if you're not playing around him, right? Like, even if he's not hard carrying every game, this guy was still in competition for for all pro. You know, he was he got number four in voting, so wherever you want to place him, he's still one of the better marksman players in the league, and that's still useful to have on any team. As far as like, is he wasted? There's probably a team that you know could have played more more like heavily around him, and maybe he would have looked better in that case. I guess. I think the the thing that I, I'm sort of feeling with this question though is also what he said in that interview about him and treats, not necessarily, I think I, I don't want to put words in his mouth because I admit that I didn't watch it. This was like trying to parse Reddit comments, interpreting his own words, but it was something about him and treats, not seeing the game exactly the same way <laughs> in terms of level of aggression. Um, I think, well, I think that it was more, I, I even it. it was it. more like that I watched. in, in scrims versus on stage, right? He was basically saying that treats is like more afraid to trade and play aggressively. Like he would in a scrim mm-hmm. on stage, which is making them kind of sit back and did you watch it as well? Cause I watched yeah, it. I watched it. Yeah. Okay. Is that accurate? Kobe, can you confirm? Um, I don't rem- remember like specific scrim talk. Um, but he, he was def- he definitely used a lot of we in addition in talking about we, you know, play differently don't, yeah, and don't expressing that he wants to play lane dominant. He, he did explicitly say that. And, and so this is what I remember the most when, you know, about double lift a lot of the time is that he's, he is really down to trade. Like when we scrimmed against him way back in the day, him and Afro would walk up and fight you to the death level one, every game, and they would have their jungler coming down at level three. And so either you sacked wave priority and just accepted like okay we're not going to scrap them or you scrap them and then their jungler comes and ganks you so then you need to bring your jungler. and they made the whole game about early like their bot lane because they, they just played this way in scrims all the time i think they've grown out of that a little bit uh even on in, in the team liquid days where he was still clearly the primary carry i don't think that it's quite so myopic in the way that they play but i still think that's where he's at his best and so i can kind of understand the caller's point hearing this trees interview that like double if wants to play aggressive, he definitely wants to be, I think the focal point of the team for a play style and how he, he approaches the game. And I can understand the viewpoint that he's maybe a little wasted if you're not able to do that. Um, but I don't think it's fair to say that he's wasted on TSM because he's clearly still a good player to his sales point. Mm-hmm. Yep. All right. Well, one final thing I'm going to throw in here. I have a report this week. It's going to be Mark. Not oh, one no. time. Have we in how many years have we had someone take a phone call on the die? Wait, 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 wait. You, you guys, I've definitely seen other people get a phone call from someone. No. And never. they had to not pick once, it up. Not once on the dive. In no. what have we been doing for? Four years now, Kobe? Yeah. Uh, you guys, 
It's pretty uh, rude, honestly. I, I'm offended. <laughs> you guys, offended I know for a fact you guys have gotten phone calls and had no. to like look at it and turn it off because you didn't have your thing on silent. Maybe someone had a has a rigger, but you answered it, the phone call, Mark. This has never to. happened before. It was important. This is unprecedented. It was yeah, very and important. His defense is, I know for a fact, I've seen someone look down and quickly mute their phone. Like, how is that I'm the saying, same? What? I'm saying mine was, <laughs> mine was less disruptive is what I'm saying. You're talking about being rude. No, how about, how about muting? Why? I muted myself. You, no one would even know. The podcast know we listeners about. wouldn't even know if you didn't you call gave, attention to it. Back the, and you didn't even know what we were talking about. I knew what you guys were talking about. It was the team. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's a hard report. Kobe doubles it up. So Mark, I'm getting nine X. You're getting you're getting some sort of penalty for next week. But that'll do it for this week's episode of the dive. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you, Honda, for making it possible. It's another hundred minute episode, I do believe. Playoffs resume tomorrow. Remember, it's another four series week, so it starts on Thursday. FlyQuest taking on the Radiant Champions cloud nine make sure you catch us live with the games that's going to be starting 12 30 pst for countdown 1 p.m pst for the game start <laughs>